Lieutenant Junior Grade, Edward Deutschman, 40, 33, 39 is my serial number. And uh, I arrived here at Del Monte in the summer of 43 uh, in a nice yellow bus that picked us up at some airport, I've forgotten which one, probably San Jose, and carted us over here and dumped us off at the front of the hotel right here in the parking area, which we called a tarmac at that time. And of course, we got off of the bus to the cheers of, go back, go back, go now when you have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Run like hell, because the whole sea of cadets out there waiting for us. Well, that one went along pretty good. And of course, then we joined in the foray, because here comes another bus. So we turned around and said the same thing. So bus after bus rolling in and dumped off the new class that was going to start the next day. This was on a Sunday. And as we were standing there, I looked around and here comes, you're not going to believe this, but a great big long black Rolls Royce. And I looked at that, complete with a chauffeur and mom and junior in the back. Junior was a new cadet, and I don't have to let you go into your imagination about how Junior was greeted. And uh, he was a very interesting man. At, uh, the Navy, in regard to taking care of your physical needs, had a program that for people who had physical problems, they wore a button. A great big button. Now, the red button means this person is to partake of no physical activity. He can attend class, but no physical activity. They're just out of sick bay or whatever. They had a yellow button that indicated that they can have limited participation in certain sports. I'll give you an example. You have a broken arm. Well, there's no reason in the world why you can't play soccer. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. You don't go watch a guy dribbling down the road with a cast on and playing soccer because that arm is going like this and it's going to catch you right alongside the head and you're going to get one well off on time. Then the blue button, and I never did, never did uh, figure out what that was all about, but getting back to Junior, uh, the next time I saw him he was wearing a red button. And every time I saw him from then on till I was gone, he wore that red button. I have a suspicion that Junior didn't make it. I would have that as a strong suspicion. But anyway, getting back to the program itself. The Navy had a marvelous program for male students in college. One of them was the V-12 program which guaranteed the student college education until he was called into the service. He could stay in college. He didn't have to listen, sit around and wait for a call. The other was a V-5 program, and that was the Navy Air Corps program. And uh, we find out it somewhere or other as we were in, talking back and forth, and of course, as you know, at that age, I was a sophomore at the time. Uh, the draft was rolling down our necks and we were very apprehensive about what was going to happen. So in the long and the short of it was, I found out what was going on with the V5 program and drove by myself on old 99 from Fresno to the ferry building in San Francisco. There are uh, two days of examination. One day was mental tests and what have you, and the second day was physical. And that physical was something you could not believe. If one tooth was out of line, you were, um, you were out of there. And by the grace of God, I passed the physical. I was in the Navy, I sworn into the Navy, 
I was totally immune from any other calls, and I was told to go back to school, which I did. And I finished a semester I was in and started in on the next one, and lo and behold, here comes the call. Now, the Navy moves in very interesting ways. If they have what would be considered a surplus or they're getting over built in terms of a certain program, they, all they do is establish a new program and back it up behind it. For example, uh, we had the pre-flight program and shortly after I was here and went on to flight training, they had what they called a WTS program, which they introduced. And the WTS program was the War Training Service. And it was a weird one. It um, called the, the student up, the, sent them to college, paid them the $75 a month that they were supposed to get. They stayed in civilian clothes. The only thing noted in the Navy was that they were in college and subject to call to go to pre-flight school. So you wonder how the Navy keeps moving these things. That's the way they, they followed the issue. If they got a surplus or a change, they just su supplement it with a, with a program that would remedy the thing. Um, the program here was, um, as you probably know, was half ground school, half a day of various classes, about seven different uh, courses, all college level, and a half a day of the most god-awful PE you ever saw in your life. Um, there was um, this area here had a lot of blacktop, and they called it of course tarmac and that's where all hell broke loose because they would they would gather the cadets on that tarmac solid and go through the calisthenics every day after we had close order drill marching over there like a bunch of wooden soldiers and push-ups and sit-ups and deep knee bends and duck walk can you imagine a duck walk you know what a duck walk is how to ruin a pair of knees in no time at all and here are these retreaded PE coaches from the high schools who were commissioned 90 day wonders. They were our coaches, they were our, so, and they would enforce us to go the length of that tarmac and back on a duck walk. Anyway, that was a part of the thrill of the thing. And um, the interesting part and the part that thrilled me to death was after I was separated or put on an inactive duty. I never did get a discharge for months, years later. Um, I went back to my registrar at the university, at the college, and wanted to get reinstated. And because the status when you left was very mixed up, as you know. You have to drop courses and you don't know whether you got it withdrawal a W or you got an F you flunked it you got it and uh, our registrar was a very nice lady very very thoughtful and uh, she looked at my transcript and she said well Ed she says uh, I have another transcript here it's from the Navy it's from the US Navy and she said those courses you took at pre-flight school are all on your transcript and it takes care of your electives. You have no electives to take, all you have to do is... I thought that was pretty great. It was everything that we had was of that level and nature that was academically acceptable. So the um, experience at Del Monte was great. <laughs> um, a little incident on the side was that uh, I don't know whether they still have it or not, but the hotel had the polo fields across the highway. Are they still there by any chance? Yeah. 
anyway across the highway, which at that time was a two-lane road, which is now 101. And we'd run across the highway over to the polo grounds. And the Navy then had taken the polo grounds and made four football fields out of them. Football field, football field, four of them. With a track, of course, all the way around. And um, there was an assembly, uh, it was an ambulance assigned to each field. So as you walked in there, you saw four football fields and four ambulances. That was initially. The whole time I was there, the three months that was there, I never saw four ambulances at one time. <laughs> one of them was always busy. Sometimes three of them were busy, talking off with broken ankles, broken arms, fractures, and what have you. I think that's the, probably the part of the story with the guy with the red button that didn't probably work out too well. But uh, soccer, uh, rugby, which I thought was fabulous, I enjoyed it very much. Um, all sorts of field sports. Then we got uh, inside stuff, which I absolutely detested. That was where the wrestling took place. I was never pinned down so many times in my life. <laughs> Sliding around on a wet, sloppy plastic mat. Boxing and all of the stuff that normally is, you'd find in an indoor part of the physical program. Well, Del Monte came to an end. And on a nice Sunday afternoon, we departed. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the little train station across on Del Monte, which had a little studio, a uh, little um, uh, station at one time, until just fairly recently, I think. And there the train was parked. And of course, close order drill, we marched in and got aboard the train. Well, my mother and my father and my wife-to-be were seeing me off. And we were marching and they were walking alongside very rapidly to keep up with us. And the next thing I saw was my wife-to-be laying flat in the dirt. Boom. And of course that went over. I didn't know what to do, whether I was going to break rank or whatever. She had, historically, she was conf uh, confronted with weak ankles and she twisted her ankle. And I saw my wife to be laying in the dirt and with that I got on the train. Fortunately, I got to Reno and got off the train for long enough. To, I can't remember whether I had a phone call or a telegram, but anyway, I almost missed the train. And we were headed for Hutchison, Kansas for primary flight training in the most marvelous airplane that the Navy ever built, the N3N Yellow Peril. The most fantastic, the most durable, the most fun-loving airplane there ever was. You, 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 you didn't fly that plane, you just zipped it on and took off. It was just a part of you immediately. And uh, I had a lot of fun with that. The, um, neat part about it was the instructor that I had was a dentist from Detroit and an avid BG pilot, race pilot. A little stubby airplane with a great big huge engine and about that long. And he was an absolute maniac as far as and he would give instruction with the only thing they had, no electronics in those days. We had the rubber tubes that went from his cockpit to mine and back, and I never could understand it. It was just nothing but a blur of words. And of course, he got a little bit indignant about that. And you, you dumb SOB, why don't you listen to me? Well, he gave me a, a set of lessons that I never will forget. One of them was um, dead stick landing. We'd fly along and he'd flick the switch, engine was off. Find a field and pretend to land on it. 
I circle around, circle around, found the field, pulled back up again, he cranked the engine up. He said, what'd you call that? I said, well, you want a dead stick landing. He said, let me show you a dead stick landing. And this is in the flatlands of Nebraska, or Kansas. And he said, this is how you do it. And with that, he flies down. He says, when you see the weeds go up over the top of the wheels, you know that you're low enough. <laughs> and so, okay, I demonstrated and that satisfied him. Then the check ride came. And the instructor that gave the check ride for the final flight had the dead stick landing. So I <laughs> down through the weed patch over the top and got back to the baseline. He said, where in the hell did you learn how to do that? <laughs> yeah, anyway, that was that was good old Hutchison, Kansas, a wonderful spot. But I tell you what, that's no place to be in the snow. It, we had a little snowstorm, and Kansas is noted to be pretty flat. And when you take off, all you see is a sheet of white, and you become disoriented so fast you won't, you can't recognize anything. Everything is flat. But it worked out okay. From Hutchison, they sent, us, sent me to Corpus Christi, Texas. And the Corpus experience was that's where you had your intermediate flight training and your advanced flight training and your commission. And the intermediate was at a, was a piece of junk called a Vault T. We called it the Vault T vibrator. It was a fixed landing gear, low wing aircraft, piece of junk. The only thing that we did with it is we learned how to fly formation and we knew we got some night flying in. And that's a fun deal because you only lights, they won't allow any lights on the plane at all, none. And you flew by looking at the fire coming out of the exhaust manifold. And you'd cozy up to that and you'd sit there. And worked out pretty good. Went to Advanced down in Kingsville, Texas. You ever heard of Mr. King, the really biggest landowner in Texas? Well, he has a town called Kingsville and a little naval base there. And that's where we were introduced to the Navy's SNJ, a marvelous airplane that the Army Air Corps called the AT-6. And uh, that worked out very nicely. Commissioned there, went to, was sent to Florida for operational training. And there I got a returning vet. They obviously wanted instructors who had overseas experience and were shot at a few times. And we flew the Wildcat, the F-4F Grumman. And this was a retired aircraft that the Navy had pulled out of the fighters and replaced it with the F-6F. The F-4F was a marvelous plane. It was fun to fly, but it wouldn't go anywhere. It was slow. And uh, we had, I had fun with it. We did all of the stuff, formation flying, night flying, and all of that. And, of course, instrument flying. Oh, God, instrument flying. Um, they put you in, of course, in the back seat, and then they pull this hood over the top of you, and you're sitting in there, and you see nothing except the instrument panel. And then you have a few lessons in instrument, climb 500 feet, make a 90 degree turn, and level off and fly. And you're wrong, you got 600 feet, do it again. Ter terrible experience. <laughs> the interesting and the most ridiculous part about it was when I took my final check ride, the very final check ride before I was commissioned, with my flight instructor was a basketball player from the college where I had come from. I thought, well, this is going to be a piece of cake. 
Well, he was a smart ass Marine. The Marine is in the Navy. You know, that's all the same program. Only one of them is a green uniform and the other one was. And uh, I thought, well, I goofed up really bad. Really bad. I admit that. And we got down on the ground and he said, that was perhaps the most god-awful damn flight I've ever seen in my life. You are a menace to the aviation. I thought, uh-oh. If you get a down, it's Great Lakes Naval Training Station and bell-bottom trousers, coats of navy blue. You're a boot. Starting all over again. I didn't like those buttons that they had, for one thing. <laughs> and he said, however, I guess you get it up. Boy, I rushed over the board because when the, when a cadet gets his up, why well, he runs over the board, puts F-I-N-I-S across the board and runs it with a piece of chalk. Then they sent me to home for a change. I hadn't been home in a, couple, in a year and a half. And then back to a new air group that was forming in Atlantic City, Air Group 97. And, uh, okay, uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife to me and I and her mother had made plans that the mother would come to New York and we were going to get married. Not that serious. Well, I reported to Atlantic City and um, among other things, the new, our new skipper had his first meeting, called all the uh, fighter pilots together in this great big room. And of course, being a smart ass ensign, I was in one of those oak chairs leaning against the back wall, propped up like this. And he said, the following pilots who are to report to Groton, Connecticut immediately. And my next words were, oh, some son of a bitch. And then he said, Ensign Edward Deutschman. And I said, oh, oh. Now that's the point where, I don't know whether you fellas are military, I've reached this or not. You have combat versus no combat. And combat, you know you're going to get shot at, but that's what I'm here for. No combat means that you're not going to do anything but eat off of the government's ticket for a time and go back home again. And that's not much to talk about. Well, as it turned out, I was sent to Groton, Connecticut, to an air group that was leaving immediately for Alameda, California flying Corsairs. My experience with Corsairs was I know what one looked like. I never sat in the cockpit. I never looked at the airplane. And I got to Green Cove Springs, I mean to Groton, Connecticut. Cold, cold, cold ice and blacktop. You taxied the plane, you put the brakes on, you slid on the ice, then you hit the blacktop, <laughs> the tires would grab the asphalt. You, you were about ready to ruin a 14-foot prop. So the executive officer said, OK, Deutschman, let's go out and get checked out in this plane. Now, check out in a new plane is a long process of being completely familiar with everything that's in that cockpit, every instrument, every level every lever, everything that's there. And he walks out and he's got his overcoat on. John Sweeney, the neatest guy in the world. But oh, what a lousy teacher. He said, okay, Ed, get in that cockpit. I didn't even know how to do that because it's got a little thing in the side where you stick your foot in and you step over the top. 
That airplane is one big puppy, in case you don't know it. It looks like a, just a regular fighter, but it's a huge thing. Fighter-wise, that is. The size of a P-47. And he said, okay, he said, uh, let's look at this thing. Um, there's your throttle, there's your stick, there's your flaps, there's your radio. I think he just about got it. <laughs> we'll see you later. That's the gospel truth. Uh, uh oh, okay. So it was so cold that they had these wrap things around the engine, the cell, with a heater on it to keep the oil from freezing. The plane captain pulled that off and got that stuff out of the way and cranked up the engine and well, here we go. So I taxied carefully over that ice and blacktop, very carefully, down to the spot where we take off. Request permission to take off. I pushed that throttle forward and I still remember the sensation. I could not believe it. I got something pushed in my back and I was like, oh, <laughs> that thing goes boom. And somebody said, listen, they take off in a short distance. You're damn right to take off in a short distance. So here we are airborne, and that's my first experience with a Corsair. And uh, went around and did some stuff, and well, I wanted to make sure that I'd try to get it up to stalling speed, and did some minor aerobatics. A couple of days later, all bachelor pilots report married pilots with their wives may be on their way, you can rent a car and go home, or if you have your own transportation. So guess who got screwed? Always the single pilot. And uh, <laughs> so we took off from Groton, Connecticut, and I'll make this quick. We had stops in Jackson, Mississippi overnight. We had stops in El Paso, Texas overnight. And we had stops and a stop in Palm Springs before we came into Alameda. The one in El Paso was hilarious. The uh, purpose of the air program there was twofold. They had B-17s that replacement fighter pilots would go up and shoot plastic bullets at it so that the people in the 17 were getting gunnery practice. Unfortunately, we find out that we were in the officer's club having a martini or two or three, that the plastic bullets would get caught in the rudders or in the elevators and they wouldn't move and then B-17 would go into the ground. The pilots were saying, we, lost, we were losing more pilots here than we did in Germany. Oh, they, the morale was lousy. Some way or other, they got wind. That is, those pilots there got wind of a maneuver that we, that we conveniently called a high-speed breakup and landing, or takeoff and landing. And it is high speed. Uh, we take off and, and we circle around back. We come in and we come right smack down the runway. Look at the tower as we go by. Swing off into formation and go on our way. Conversely, if you're coming into land, you do just the opposite. You come on around, you sweep across the runway, you swing around, do a big old Emelman up here and come in and come into land. Okay, we take off. We're headed for Palm Springs. There's a lot of Corsairs in the air when a whole, and of course being a rather very junior ensign, boy, I mean about as junior as you could get. You're a tail end Charlie. You're the last guy in the, in the string. Everybody was in the air, including the skippers and everybody. And I had not 
had enough brains to turn my radio off of the frequency at El Paso. And I hear this voice, and this is Colonel so-and-so. All Navy pilots return to El Paso immediately. And I said, okay, Ed, what do you do now? Well, conscience being the wisest of the thing, I turned on our frequency. I said, Skipper, we just got word from the base at El Paso. Did you hear about it? He said, no. He said, we've been ordered back to base. So the whole squadron does it. <laughs> back to base. Taxi up to the parking area. Get out. And here comes the colonel. You have never in your life, this is the Air Force now. This isn't the infantry. Here comes the colonel. And he's got his crop pants on, horseback riding. He's got the shiny brown boots to here. He's got his Eisenhower jacket to here, and he's got ribbons from here to here. And he says, um, you are all under arrest. You will report to the brig immediately. Subject to court martial. And we had the most wonderful commander of all of our aircraft and the squad in the air group. John Highland. If you are new and familiar with names, John Highland ended up being the supreme Navy commander of all of the ships in the Pacific. He was a marvelous man, a great pilot, a real, just, just a good guy. And so he heard what the colonel had to say. He says, hey, Colonel, come here. He said, um, and I heard him say this. He said, uh, do you have a telephone handy? And the colonel says, what do you want a phone for? And he says, I, um, I am in a position where I have to call the Secretary of Navy, John Forstall. And the Colonel's face is boom. <laughs> and he said, well, he said, maybe we're carrying this situation a little too far. Uh, why don't you uh, depart immediately, making as quiet, get away as you can, and get out of here. And so we did, I mean, on to, Palm Springs, but that was the funniest sight in the world when, when Highland confronted this guy, he just melted like a bunch of bu hot butter. Um, am I taking way too much time here? Of course, you only can say yes, that's the only answer. So uh, I was in Air Group 10, Fire Squadron 10, the Grim Reapers. We flew into Alameda went aboard ship, went aboard the Intrepid, and on our way to Hawaii. Stopped in Hawaii, because get this, Ensign Ed Deutschman had never landed on an aircraft carrier in his life. He qualified on the thing called the Wolverine, which floated around in the, on Lake Michigan, in the most odd, god-awful weather you ever saw, and you had to make six or nine successful landings on that thing and the lake was pitching and the landing signal officer was going crazy. The ship would go up and we'd go down and bam. Anyway, that was my, that was my experience as far as uh, carrier landings were concerned. So this very bright morning about 5 a.m. we take off just as the sun's coming up. And I come around for my first approach on a landing, and boom, there's the sun. Couldn't see squat. Couldn't see a thing. Finally wiggled around enough and came aboard, landed, and did that enough times successfully to qualify. And that was a very happy occasion. 
I didn't always have happy occasions, but anyway, that was one of them. We went on from Hawaii to by way of Wake. You always stopped by Wake because that was where you bombed the Japanese vegetable gardens every time you went by. Give you a chance to get a hop in. That would give you a chance for some practice and so on. And went on into a atoll called Ulithi. Have you ever heard of Ulithi? It's a gorgeous, huge lagoon, one of many out in the Pacific. And we sailed into that lagoon. Crystal clear water, you could see the, this beautiful. Sailed in there and holy mackerel, everything was gray. The whole lousy fleet was in there. And uh, from there we took off for our very first mission. We flew, we sailed up the Yellow Sea and uh, bombed, of course, then Korea was owned by the Japanese. So we bombed a little bird called Yusa, USA, Yusa. And uh, whatever the purpose of that was, I don't know, but we dropped our bombs and went back. And, and somebody was saying, what, what's the deal with this USA? And he says, hey, you know what? At that time, you people are all too young to remember this, but Japanese goods was junk, absolute, pure, unadulterated junk. Anybody goes into the store and pick up a product and says rather than made in China, it said made in Japan, they'd put it back down again. Wouldn't buy it. Well, guess what? If you put made in USA on it, <laughs> And lo and behold, that was the truth. Everything they stamped out was made in USA. <laughs> that was just a one-time deal. The next missions were big time. We were getting ready for Okinawa. There, you never saw so many little islands and atolls around. We had a field day with all of the all of the targets that we had, and. Lo and behold, the thrill of my life was on April 1st, 1945. I opened the invasion of Okinawa. I was a lead pilot and the flying fighter covers for the Marines that were going aboard, going in the ship, invading the forces. Fortunately, there was no, there was really no Japanese um, resistance to speak of, but that didn't last long. Uh, we did our work on Iowa and, and the surrounding islands, and then came the biggie. Uh, a, 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 a raid over Tokyo. And that was an experience that you'll never forget. Uh, first of all, we all got mixed up, mostly on purpose, because the lead pilots were doing stuff we didn't like. But anyway, the anti-aircraft was intense. You could almost get out of the plane and walk on the air, on the stuff, come it up. And it was multicolored, red, green, blue. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Did you ever hear about that? I hadn't either. But it, the, everything was, was multicolored. Well, we quickly made our, our pass over our target. Tokyo Rose said that that night that somebody had bombed a school. I was the guy, but it was a obviously a barracks. You could see the soldiers down there. Tokyo Rose was marvelous. Uh, just for the fun of it, somebody said, why don't we change the configuration of our insignia on the plane? And so, yeah. So the engine, the cell, that's the covering around the engine in the front had a band that went around it, and they painted it white. That night, Tokyo Rose said, what are you guys, the interpreter, trying to do painting your, painting your planes different? 
that night she knew about it. Japan was not a fun spot to be involved with. Um, at the end of the, or toward the end of the flight, we come back over Tokyo Bay, and here was a harbor boat going across the across the bay. And I had picked up a wing, a fellow that I was flying wing on, and uh, we had our fun with that harbor boat. It, it it was at the bottom of the bay when we left, but. Uh, our exploits there in terms of our effectiveness was pretty pretty good. Uh, kamikazes were thick. They were just absolutely all over the place. We had a number, several minor hits which got repaired quickly. We had a a third fleet that was a repair fleet with repair vessels and the like. But the worst one of all was that um, I managed to lose my train of thought. Where am I? The um, kamikaze mm -hmm. repairs on cruise. Well, let's see. There's my grocery list. After Okinawa, what were the uh, engagements that you uh, endeavored? Uh, Okinawa never ended, as far as we were concerned. Um, well, it, it ended at the end of the war. We were still fighting Okinawa at the end, end of the war. The um, thing that was the most interesting was that um, Our air group itself was was a split. The uh, the Navy, in its infinite wisdom, decided that they were going to do away with the di their dive bombers. The dive bomber was the Hell Diver. It was a piece of junk made by Curtis Aircraft. Uh, it was big, it was clumsy, it was slow, it was vulnerable. So I guess I have a suspicion that the Navy saw what the Army had done, and the Army had gone into what they call fighter bombers, and they put uh, big heavy guns on fighter planes, 20 millimeters if you will, that's a big gun. And they use them for strafing. Their favorite target, of course, was railroads, shipping, and what have you. And so the Navy decided to do the same thing. So they took VF-10 and split it in two, VF-10 and VBF-10, which was fighter bomber group. Unfortunately, the skipper of VF-10, who was a neat guy by the name of Roy, R-A-W-I-E, Roy, he was sent over as the skipper of the VBF quadrant, and we got a piece of work called Commander Clark, and he was our skipper. Uh, then the ambiance was never the same from then on. It was, um, Clark had no personality. He was a nice guy. He was all right. But uh, he was uh, 
more interested in getting back to Honolulu to his Hawaiian friends. Uh, Why don't we take a break at this point, a break in your discussion, since Kevin Howe from the Herald is here, and Kevin probably has other interviews to, to do today, other stories. Well, I do have some. Give, let's give Kevin and others a chance to ask a few questions uh, at this stage, and then we can... can Fine. Fantastic. You're Good. Plastic bullets at uh, El Paso. <laughs> Did they that. actually cause any uh, crashes, or was yeah. that? Yeah. Well, the, the plastic bullets would wedge in where the rudders would bend, they'd wedge in there. And the elevators along the side, they'd wedge in there, and they wouldn't move. They were frozen. And they were a very disheartened bunch, believe me. And those were 50 caliber plastic bullets, so they were good size, right? Yeah. In your flight flying in the combat role and mission, uh, was there any time that you felt like you were ready to uh, meet your savior? Uh, no. I had a very non-combative <laughs> problem, however. Um, when coming back from a mission, and uh, the final leg of an aircraft carrier landing is you come down low over the, over the island, do a big swing around and come in at 500 feet and circle around and land. So for some reason or other, when I flew over the stack of the ship below me, boom, and my seat went clear to the bottom. And I said, the, uh, the Corsair is a big airplane. It's a big airplane. When I went down to the bottom, the instrument panel was clear up here. I couldn't see squat. <laughs> and being a fairly athletic, young 22-year-old, I had strong legs. And I, I had no other choice than to just jam my legs on the rudder pedals and push myself up. And um, the plane was designed, as most of them, I guess, were, with the seat and then a big hunk of metal behind it says armor plate. And then behind that was the radio. Well, apparently the radio man had worked on the plane the day before and he didn't get the seat stuck back in properly. The seat had two pins up here, spring-loaded latches, and two of them down here. And of course, I had flight gloves on, which are skinny little leather, or they're beautiful, but... And I got situated up there, holding myself up so I could see I was going to fly into somebody, but I got out of the pattern and was floating around up there. And I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to try and work something out here. So I reached around and reached for the pin took my gloves off first and lined the thing up and went click holy macro I got a I'm stuck I got one so I tried again I went over here did the same thing had the same luck I had two both of them up here nothing down here Nothing down here it was clear down here in the bottom, and I thought, well, you think you're going to hook up my unhook myself and crawl down the belly of this thing? You're crazy as hell. So I called the ship and I told them the problem, and they said, well, they said you got two options. You can uh, fly up a couple thousand feet, bail out, and a sub chaser uh, destroyer escort will pick you up. And uh, first of all, that didn't sound like a very interesting option. We're not taking any kind of a break here. Uh, and uh, the other option is come on in and 
good luck. So with fear and apprehension, with that instrument panel sitting right here, and two pins back here, and two loose ones down here, I went aboard. And holding my breath as I took the hook and landed, and everything was okay, I was, thank God. <laughs> okay, let's take a break. There was no such thing. To, uh, they, uh, oh, here's another funny one. Um, the Japs practically were gone with zeros. There weren't any, really any left. You rarely see one. They see a jack every once in a while, which is a high performance zero. Um, but your kills were largely kamikazes. This buddy of mine, Al Lurch, he's a, he's a character, nice young, nice guy from Pennsylvania, rural Pennsylvania. And uh, he takes off with one of the flights. Unfortunately, I wasn't in it, but he was one of the, our flights were divisions of four planes. And uh, he runs into a whole swarm of kamikazes. With that coarse air, you couldn't fly slow enough to, <laughs> to stay with those kamikazes. He'd keep passing them up all the time. This he would fire at them. He couldn't, he couldn't get them in focus. And so he goes out, drops his wheels and his flaps, and goes pooping along at about 100 knots and just rakes the sky with his 50 caliber machine guns. He shoots down six kamikazes in one shot. Well, five is the Navy Cross. So he automatically got the Navy Cross in one mission. You talk about a bunch of, pardon my expression, pissed off pilots when they found out those that were already eligible for the Navy Cross are working on it. That when one flight on one flight, he got the whole banana. <laughs> but he was very modest about it. But yeah, that was hilarious. When the war came to an end, where were you and what were your personal feelings reflecting back upon your days at the Del Monte Flight School and where you'd gone and how did you feel? Well, delighted, of course. That's for, for starters. Uh, what the future holds was another real big one. As I knew what my status in life was going to be, I wanted to marry this girl. I had no education. I still had a couple of years of, co well, a year left of college. No occupation. Um, uncertainty as to what I wanted to do, including nothing, going back to civilian life. Go to the airlines, try to get on as a pilot. Stay in the Navy, which was not a good option. It's not a good idea to make a career out of being on an aircraft carrier. There's just something basic about the thing. You're going to get yourself clobbered on that ship one way or the other. Either you're going to run into the ocean or you're going to run into the island or you're going to run into another plane. And so uh, the, uh, thank you. The relation. You mentioned something about martinis back in training. Now, this is the best that uh, we could do for you, though. <laughs> Good, okay. Well, that's fine. NPS, that's very dignified. As far as pre flight was concerned, I know that I, by any measure, I was at the best pre flight school in the Navy. If you saw a list of where the other pre-flight schools were, you'd agree with me uh, totally. How does Pasco, Washington sound, for example? Um, Some place in the Dakotas. Um, 
I don't know why I was so lucky to get to a pre-flight school that was only 150 miles from where I lived because we got one day off on Sundays and my wife and my wife-to-be and my mother would come over and visit and others would come over except uh, one day I pulled a, a real Dilbert. We were doing physical, passing physical tests and these particular ones were chin-ups and I was waiting my turn and being a smart aleck I was over there chinning, waiting some more, chin some more. Guess what? When it was my turn, you're supposed to do 10. I did eight. I was put on the weak squad, which meant you gave up your liberty on Sunday. I said, that's not workable. So by golly, the next, I lost my liberty, but the next week I went out to take that test. Boy, I did my 10, bam, 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 and that was it. Goodbye, I'm out of here. Cheers. Cheers. Ed, uh, going back to your pre-flight experience, you arrived in a yellow bus. The cadets who were already there were cheering, greeting and yeah. cheering the arrival of the new cadets. Walk us through that first 24 hours uh, upon arrival. Gladly. The first thing was the most wonderful experience that you could ever imagine. We were assigned to the hotel rooms. The Navy went in and stripped all of the rooms with the furniture and so forth and put in, I think it was two double bunks. Might have been one, but two. And of course, every room had a bath. You don't go to the Del Monte Hotel and go down the end of the hall to the bathroom. And so that was absolutely marvelous. The strictness here was unbelievably mean. I mean, they were awful. These guys were trained for white gloves to come in and inspect everything in sight. Can you imagine a pair of socks, men's that is, to do it right, you had to lay a sock down flat. Then you had to lay the other sock exactly on top of it, precisely on top of it. Then you took the toe and you rolled it and rolled it and rolled it and rolled it and rolled it until you got to the top. Then you took it and flipped one side over to the lip over and you got the nice neat little roll. Then you weren't through yet. Then you went into your drawer and you stacked it with the other ones in a precise row. And if, none of, if any of those steps were missed, you caught hell. Demerits, and if not demerits, you lost your liberty. And everything was like that. Of course, you saw the old GI stuff where the guy, the guy comes in and wipes his finger over the, thresh, over the top of the door. And, and the cupboards had to be just right. Uh, everything was close order drill. We mustered for breakfast. We marched into this beautiful... To the dining room? That great big beautiful dining room where they had put... Oh yeah, yeah, there's a picture of it where they had uh, put the tables and the chairs, white table linens, white napkins, the whole nine yards, and a table captain standing at the end, which was another cadet, at attention that is. We'd march in and we'd march to our table. We'd go over to our chair and we'd stand there at attention. And you stood there till every cadet was in that room ready to sit down and eat. And then somebody would yell, sit! And boy, you sat and grabbed, and that was it. They were really, it was really an experience. Because the grabbing part was a part <laughs> that we were a hungry bunch of cadets, I'll tell you. What kind of food did they serve? I, all I can remember it was very acceptable. <laughs> and 
did you have a specific length of time that you were allowed to eat? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Uh, that, uh, uh, the time limit on food wasn't necessarily a, uh, a factor at all. <laughs> we, we got rid of the food so fast you wouldn't know what ever happened to it. Then did you reassemble and march out? That's right. We stood at attention, marched out table by table. And uh, I can't remember whether we were dismissed then. I think we were probably dismissed to go on to whatever other activity then we had. How did your day end on that? Uh, how did that first day come to a close? Um, satisfactory. I had uh, a roommate from... Uh, What's Pataluma? Is that up there? Mm -hmm. Where they raise prunes and stuff? And he was a nice, nice young man. We got into a lot of arguments about prunes and raisins and what have you because I was a farm boy. And he was too. The courses were tough. As you can see, they were rather precise in terms of their acceptability. You had to write neatly, you had to do everything just very, very accurately. Uh, I don't recall having any trouble with the academics, except I never did know, learn Morse code. <laughs> <laughs> Your classes, uh, some of them you said were uh, flight training, uh, well, you we had flight training, but then the classes themselves included things like ship identification, aircraft oh, identification. Right. A lot of ide aircraft identification. And uh, they would have it on the, uh, on the little trip thing, <coughs> projector, and they could go to a hundredth of a second. And, you just, and uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, for our aircraft identification, uh, worked out pretty well as far as I was concerned, except when I got in the air and saw an airplane I couldn't identify. <laughs> <So> <laughs> How did they test you at pre-flight school? You know, I don't remember. I really don't. And behind you is some of, I guess, your uniforms and such that you wore and actually in combat and flying. I wonder, for the benefit of Kevin here, you might want to explain something. And I think maybe towards the end, maybe we can get a picture with him standing up against with it and such like that that might provide a little more. Uh, we did uh, talk about that. Oh, you earlier. did beforehand. Yeah, while I was down there. Very quickly, yes. Uh, this is my flight suit. I dearly liked it because it was light and uh, comfortable. Uh, this is a monstrosity that they came out with toward the end of the war. This plugs into a valve in the cockpit and it's called a G-suit. And it's a G-suit because this is an inflatable bag that fits right around your thigh. And when you're coming out of a spin or out of a loop or something like that, you're pulling a lot of G-forces. I mean a lot of G-forces. And this thing gets firm around your thigh and uh, cuts out blackouts. Um, frankly, I rarely use it. I thought it was a big joke, but of course, the good old Mae West, and uh, that was that's about it. What's the significance of the patch on the flight suit? You've got a, it's like a sun over a strike banner. Yes. I can't see the whole thing, but it's a shield. It looks like a, what's the name of that patch? China, Burma, India. Okay. Uh, <laughs> at, at the end of the war, uh, we conveniently sailed right into Tokyo Bay. We're parked 
right next to the Missouri, the big, big battleship. And we're all fat and dumb and happy waiting for the surrender. And lo and behold, we got orders to leave. And a show of force, get this, a show of force in Korea and China. So up the Yellow Sea we go through the muddy water, and the natives in their sampans going back and forth. Why they didn't get clobbered, I don't know. But we, we didn't slow down former and we just went straight ahead. Um, I flew over Manchuria, Port Darwin, uh, into China, into Russia. And lo and behold, here comes Mao's communist. This is a God's truth, already climbing over the wall, invading China. I say, uh oh, there's World War III. There's the Cold War coming. And it was the most, and they were going right through the, right through the rice paddies and the coolie farmers out there working. They just walked right by them, and if they were in the way, there's that didn't matter. And uh, then our purpose uh, was to go on down the Chinese coast and hit some of the principal cities like Shanghai and so forth and have a show of force. There's where our show of force comes in again. We're supposed to fly over and make ourselves known. Well, guess what? Flew into Shanghai and here, big as life, sitting on top of the post is a Japanese flag. So we swing around and come back again. Look up there. Lo and behold, no Japanese flag. There's a Union Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Flew around again. Lo and behold, the stars and stripes. And now, if you can make any sense out of all that baloney, I'd like to know. Well, it's a show of force. Show of you know? course. Yeah, they, they, they finally got the word. Yeah, finally got the yeah, information. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was hilarious, I'll I, tell you. I have a, a question for my, my friend Ed. He was kind enough to give me his course notes, which I read uh, from course he had. But I'm curious, when did you receive these, Ed? Those are a part of the cadet uniform. What year was it? 1943. Incidentally, if anybody wants it, I have a full set of whites. I think it's a full set, including the socks belt and the whole he bed. He has lots more. He hasn't told us about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the interesting stories that we love to tell here when we take people through the school and the dining room is the picture that uh, John has uh, graciously shown there of you and the cadets up there in the dining room. Well, we had this young gentleman here, uh, Paul Trio, who was born and raised in Pacific Grove, and he was a busboy here during this time when you folks were all, you know, going through training. And uh, he said to himself, in fact, you, you interviewed and seen Paul before, but anyway, he said, this is my way of getting out of Pacific Grove. And he went and joined the Navy, <laughs> and, uh, went as an E-1. Uh, and of course, you know, he had to wait until he turned to the right age, but then he went on to retire as a Navy captain, uh, you know, wow. here and, uh, and, uh, and went in the submarine force. Uh, but he'll be one of the gentlemen that will be joining you and the rest of your family members at the Battle of Midway Dinner on Saturday the 4th of June. Oh, good. Okay. John. Oh, one of the things that... <laughs> that... Uh, got me shook in right from the very beginning. The first thing I noticed when we walked onto the campus here was that gorgeous, warm, saltwater pool. Big, beautiful pool. I thought, oh boy, our swimming is going to be great. Well, guess what? No sooner had we got settled in, the pool filtering system went to hell and the pool was shut down. Now, you're not going to believe this because I can't even I can't even imagine it. The Navy took us and put them on one of those yellow box things. They drove us clear over to 17 Mile Drive. 
And when you got over in that forested area along the 17 Drive, uh, they took a dirt road inside and in there was a pond. Well, calling it a pond was a nice word for a swamp. There was not one piece of docking any place. There was a raft nowhere. There was nothing except this dirty, muddy water and the bank. <coughs> well, then we go through all of our various Navy swimming things that you had to do so be able to float for so many seconds and what have you. And of course the final one was when you go in with your khakis on, they will let you take your shoes off. You, I'm sure you've all heard of this terrible thing. And while you're treading water, because the water was deep enough, you couldn't touch the bottom, you slip the pants off, and while you're treading water, you tie a knot in each leg. And then you whip the pants over your head and frantically grab for the waist to hold it. Well, fortunately, if you did it right, there's a little bit of air on each leg. Then you had to be able to get that thing and slip it under your neck and float that way. You did that until you did it right. Now, the interesting part was, what do you do when they want to get on the bus to go home? <laughs> Your khakis are wet. I can't remember whether we had dry khakis or not, but we must have. I'm sure they wouldn't have put us on the bus with wet khakis. But no shower, no nothing. They had to go back to the base, no shoes on, and head for the shower and get cleaned up. And that was a terrible, terrible experience. I don't know how they, could they find, they had a, wasn't there a pool at Pacific Grove down there at the beach? I remember there was a hot, there was a salt water pool down there at, at one time. Well, just to let you know that when I came into the Navy in 1960, that's one of the things you had to do also in training, besides jumping off this high tower. Oh, yeah. And uh, with all politeness to the young ladies, uh, hanging on and yelling, Geromino, because this is where be the height of the ship you'd be on if the ship was going to go down. And then tie that on to it and uh, make, it, make it float. Well, the Navy was good at taking up all these, these weird things like jumping off of towers and what have you. Uh, we had uh, been commissioned. We had gone through all of the stuff and ready to take our fleet assignments. And be darned if they didn't send us to Glenview, Illinois to do so, the test with, uh, with jumping off of the tower deal and several other things. What, what what what's the deal? Are you gonna decommission you if you flunk? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to explore the historical record just a moment because you okay. mentioned uh, sports uh, and athletic training. So this is a photograph of the Del Monte football team that you refer to. Um, the Naviators. Did you ever play against any of these guys? Uh, I'm going to have to be incredibly honest. The Navy uh, made it a very definite point that as they pulled in V-5 cadets that were, that they looked upon as a possible football player, they got them in awful fast and we never put on a football suit, football uniform. These guys were all Ace high players at their college, and the Navy made a very definite effort to. Uh, well, for example, uh, one year, Great Lakes Naval Training Center it was the number one football team in the nation. And uh, St. Mary's was noted for outstanding football teams. And that was their, the Navy way of, uh, well, it's good PR for one thing. Did they, as a corps of cadets, did they have you go to the games to cheer? No, they, haven't, no, they wouldn't play games around here. They went to the stadiums where they would seat 100,000 people. They, weren't gonna, they didn't want to mess around here. That's right. They took them to Keysar Stadium. That's where the games were. Sure. Happened. Yeah, right. And, and they packed the house. Oh, yeah. Um, 
You were here during that football season uh, in 1943. Uh, it was a very colorful time period, and I think your, the Naviator uh, mag publications or newsletters that you kept helped to tell a little bit about that season. Did you ever see notable friends of Sam Morris's like Bob Hope or? Oh. Uh, one day, I was out in this, what we always called the tarmac, the parking lot out in front, and I saw this huge tent going up by the hotel. Huge thing. I said, what in the world's that all about? Well, I cut right to the chase. He said, well, Bob Hope is here and he's going to put on a program. And I'll tell you what, he entertained us and he had a show and a half. And I thought, that guy just built up a whole bunch of brownie points as far as I was concerned. Because <laughs> obviously he was a good friend of Bob Hope's, I mean of Bing Crosby's. And Crosby had his house over on 17 Mile Drive. So Hope was just in and out here a lot. In fact, when Crosby used to have his clam bake, his, the really good Crosby tournament, golf tournament, Bob Hope played in it every year. He was a part of the entertainment and he made everybody mad. But, uh, <laughs> I remember uh, I was watching, I think we were over at Cypress Point, uh, Bob Hope and Dr. Kerry Middlecoff were teamed up together. And of course, uh, Middlecoff was out driving him forever. So Middlecoff would have his shot. He'd saunter up and finally get up where his ball is and he'd sit there in his cart or whatever. And here comes Middlecoff. I mean, here comes Hope, hits a ball, stands there, tells a joke, walks around, fiddles around, hits another shot, and Middlecoff got so PO'd. <laughs> that it was, it was, this was for money for him. I mean, this, he wasn't entertainment. This is, he was out for the bucks, and he was very upset about the lackadaisical attitude of Hope. Now the Hotel Del Monte uh, had a very famous bar on the ground floor. Uh, when you were here as a pre-flight school cadet, did they serve, was it still a bar or did they convert it for other uses? You're kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> that was one of my learning process. That's the first time I'd ever heard of a happy hour. And I wonder, what is this happy hour stuff? Well, I found out in a hurry what the happy hour was. To answer your question, they served the real McCoy. <laughs> well, this is, this is great because we don't have any photographs or records of that. The Navy command that came in after the pre-flight school did not serve alcohol in there. They converted it into a, just a, a, a fountain, a soda oh, fountain. That's no fun. <laughs> so, Ed, do you remember any special evenings at happy hour uh, going into the into the bar? No. Uh, you know something ridiculous. I was pretty much dry. Uh, one one drink and I was through, um, maybe two. I, I was never uh, what you might consider a boozer. I just, uh, it was just the nature of the thing. In fact, I, I'm, not, I'm not now, but. Uh, would a lot of uh, the cadets go in? Would it be crowded? Oh yeah, oh yeah, boom. They had, as soon as they got, got a chance to get loose while well, they were down there. Could you tell us a little bit about your family and your wife-to-be since they came to uh, see you from time to time while you were at the pre-flight school? Yeah, uh, as you know, as I said, my Catherine and I were planning to be married in New York with her mother in attendance. And uh, then all this 
transition came and the change. Um, then we uh, were on the ship and finally, after a long boring time, got relieved and were dropped off of the ship in Saipan. And a jeep carrier took us to Alameda, the Great Circle Route around by the Aleutians. And uh, my wife-to-be and my parents met me there. And all I can remember is, come on, follow me and shut up. Because the first place my parents are having their 25th wedding anniversary. We were scheduled to get married. And all this was going on and there were typical wedding plans, you know, with lunches and buffets and what have you. This is, just don't answer, ask any questions, just do what you're told and <laughs> it was pretty good advice because I was baffled. I didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> but we were married on the 25th of November, 1945. When she and your parents came to uh, see you, uh, when you had Liberty on Sunday Liberty at Del Monte, were you able to go into town with them yes. sometime? Yes, yes. We'd go into the Carmel, right. What would you do? A uh, couple of nice eating places that we enjoyed. Um, uh, uh, the building is still there. Um, it had a huge picture. I think it was a movie actress. Jean Harlow, whatever. Uh, it's still there. It's an Italian restaurant now. Uh, we go out to the Mission Ranch. Um, that was for fun. We'd go dance in the bar, and that was a hilarious time. Um, we had a, a terrible situation. My wife's aunt had a beautiful house in Carmel. And uh, it was sizable, reasonably sizable. So we could invite all our friends over for the weekend. So they'd come over and we would go chasing around the area and so on. It was great, great fun. Did I answer your question by any chance? I, you, you, did, you went to the Mission Ranch and a couple of the restaurants in town. Gosh, what was the name of that one that everyone knows? It's got the the uh, Tudor type shingles that are on the top. It's got an Italian name now, but uh, yeah. Well, you're not the one I'm talking about. You shouldn't talk too much about lunch. Uh, yeah, because it does close. Ed, Ed, I have a question about about Kay. I miss love a whole lot. And, and was she out of Stanford? Yes. When you guys got married? So what, what, what year did she graduate from Stanford? 45. 45, that's what I yeah. thought. Okay. Yeah, because I was in, I was in 45 too. And no wonder she was anxious. <laughs> Why? To get married to you. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Well, I have just a couple of other questions, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. And, um, the Del Monte Express, uh, the train, did it continue to run during the war years? Well, I don't know. It took us to wherever we to San Francisco. Okay. So you did ride the Del Monte Express. Yes. Uh, at, as part of your Navy. Right. When we left here, the cadets were loaded on that on that train, and then we were sent to San Francisco. And just tell me how you did that. Did they um, form you? Did you create form up outside of the hotel, march over to the depot? That is correct. Yes, sir. And then boarding. Did you? have a formation, a designated formation or approach, or was it just a free-for-all to get on the train? I don't really remember. I do remember the uh, train that uh, I, we had to take a train from, 
from San Francisco to Hutchinson, Kansas for primary training. And uh, much to my surprise, I, uh, the Navy provided a regular stateroom for us. And now, as far as the airfield, uh, while you were in pre-flight school, did you ever um, go to the airfield and uh, fly at all? No. 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 no actual air ops? No. Now, the Navy did have um, aircraft operating in the area from the Del Monte uh, field. Well, there's the Naval Auxiliary, Auxiliary Air Station that was established there. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you and the other cadets were no. never integrated into that. No, but this uh, reminds me of something we mentioned earlier. Uh, if the Navy would see a backup of uh, a program, for example, a pre-flight program, and they found that they had more cadets waiting outside to get in than they had accommodations for them to, to be taken care of. Um, for example, did you know there was a program called WTS? I did not. Well, the pre-flight pre program got crowded so they established, well, I mentioned it, the WTS is War Training Service. You wore civilian clothes, you were paid the, the, the amount of money, you were in the Navy, but you were sent to a university and took academic classes half a day, and then of all the lucky things, you got to fly a Piper Cub. And if that wasn't a kick in the pants, because I was sent to the University of Colorado, and the airfield was out of Boulder, up on a bluff, and the wind would blow quite nicely up there. So here comes the cadet with his cub, when they'd come in and land, he'd cut the throttle, and the plane would just sit there, and sit there, and sit there, and sit there, and finally it'd move a little bit because the wind was keeping it blowing. One time, a, a number of us ran out and got on each side of the airplane on the wings and pulled the puppy down on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> now, Ed, I, I think this will be my final question uh, about the hotel itself. After the attack at Pearl Harbor, civil defense uh, put gun mounts on the tower at Hotel Del Monte. It wasn't until 1943 that the Navy uh, requisitioned the hotel and established the pre-flight school. That was early 43 uh, before you arrived. Were there gun mounts on the tower when, when you arrived as an aviation cadet? Not that I recall. Were you issued any um, weapons during your no. time here? No. Your weapons training came later. Though. Yeah. Um, actually, our weapons training was minimal because it's all in, in regard to weapons on an aircraft. Uh, we did have uh, uh, um, a series of lessons in the use of the 45 and the 38. We had target practice and so on. Uh, we did have skeet shooting for, again, the pilots for leading the, the idea of, of leading and shooting ahead of the target and so on. All of which I found to be a lot of fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, Ed, I, I greatly appreciate here, being here today, bringing these mementos of that time period at the Del Monte Pre-Flight School and, and World War II, and I'm sure I can speak for everyone here. But this has been quite a remarkable morning for all of us. Well, it's very remarkable for me because you've been such a good audience and seemed like you're almost half interested in what I had to say. <laughs> <laughs>